So good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all of you. And a warm welcome to this side event on the outcomes and socioeconomic impact of REP Plus after the date of implementation. This session is hosted by IUFRO, the International Union of Forest Research Organizations. And my name is Christoph Fildburger, and I'm heading IUFRO's Global Forest Expert Panels Program, in short, GFEP. Um, I hope everybody can hear me both uh, online and on site. Uh, for those who don't know, uh, IUFRO is the global network for forest science collaboration, connecting around 600 member organizations, which represent about 15,000 forest scientists all around the world. The core of IUFRO's chief program are objective and independent scientific assessments of key issues of high global concern and our chief of publications target the science policy interface and support more informed decision making at all levels. Today we will present and discuss our most recent report titled Forests, Climate, Biodiversity and People, Assessing a Decade of Red Plus. Our publication will be available from now on our, on our website. Just to let you know, this meeting will be recorded and it will be made publicly available in our IUFRO YouTube channel after our session. Uh, as this is a hybrid event, most of our speakers and participants are joining online. And you, as you can see, some of us are on site too. Uh, please ask any questions to the speakers using the Q&A box on your screen. And if you are participating on site in Seoul, and you want to ask a question, please indicate that by raising your hand um, during the QME part of the session, of course, and my colleague Gerda Wolfram will provide you with the microphone when you get the floor. Uh, you see two of our speakers on site at the podium. One of our lead authors, John Barotter, is sitting there and the representative of the UNFF triple C Secretariat, um, Dirk Nemitz. Uh, in addition uh, to the speakers we have on site, I have seen that there are two other authors of our red study in the audience, uh, Amy du uh, Duchel and Cesar Sabogal. Uh, both of them contributed to our chapter on Red Plus challenges and lessons learned. Uh, welcome very much, Amy and Cesar. Uh, after we have uh, closed the online session, you will want to approach our speakers and authors on site for any questions and for further discussions. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, dear participants, as we all know, and as was highlighted again recently by the IPCC, forests play a pivotal role in regulating our climate change, uh, the global climate, and they represent a cornerstone of our strategy to tackle the climate change. Uh, REPLAS, the reducing emissions from deforestation and forest degradation, including conservation, sustainable management of forests, and enhancement of forest carbon stocks, was conceived as a framework to address this role and agreed by the signatories to the Climate Convention. Our new chief assessment now evaluates the actual on the ground impacts of REPLAS activities on forests, climate, biodiversity, and people. Today, we will present and discuss our findings and publish our report. In the first part of our session, key findings of our, stand, of our study will be presented by the lead authors. Uh, again, I remind you, please post your questions in the Q&A box or raise your hand after we have heard the presentations. We will address as many of them as time allows after the talks. And um, after the Q&A sessions, our speakers will also um, respond to them in writing online. As a first speaker, I'm very pleased to introduce John Barotta, who is one of the editors and lead authors of the report. Dr. Barotta is program leader for international science issues with the US Forest Service, and he's also the current IUFA president. He will provide an overview of the study's background and he will provide the key messages. John, you have the floor, please. Yes, thank, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Christoph. Um, as you've just mentioned, um, Red Plus was conceived as an instrument of high income to financially reward.
gas emissions. It evolved in the context of the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, initially through the Bali Action Plan in, in, of 2007, um, which aimed at, at reducing greenhouse gas emissions from both deforestation and forest degradation. That was when it was known as just red without the plus. Its scope was expanded in 2010 by the Cancun decision on red plus to include additional activities such as the conservation of forest carbon stocks, sustainable management of forests and enhancement of forest carbon stocks. 10 years ago in, in 2012, the UFRO led uh, GFEP program published a report evaluating the potential benefits, trade-offs, and trade-offs between forest conservation, management, and restoration actions foreseen under Red Plus activities in terms of forest carbon sequestration, as well as on biodiversity conservation and the livelihoods and well-being of people. It's been 15 years now since the first Red Agreements and 10 years after our 2012 re report. So, it, it, so, so much has happened in, in, in that period. And this new report examines what we have learned from experience about the impacts, challenges, and lessons learned from Red Plus implementation worldwide. At the next slide, if someone else is controlling the slides. There are no slides. No, there are no slides, that's okay. Actually, there should be slides. <laughs> In a perfect world, there are slides. Yeah, I, I, uh, I, I assume that uh, the due to all these technical the technical difficulties we um, we have, uh, you have to talk. I can I can that. summarize the contents. Yeah. Yes, please. Okay, let me just continue. Okay, so now we have a, a very brief summary of, of the main conclusions, which will be elaborated upon by by the lead authors of the. Of the uh, of, of the particular chapters dealing with these, so among the main conclusions, uh, we know that growing forests absorb nearly one third of, of the greenhouse gas emissions produced by by humans, but this contribution is not fully realized due to the on to on due to ongoing forest loss, which contributes to about ten percent of the annual anthropogenic CO two emissions. Within the next decade conservation and sustainable management of forests are likely to be the most effective red plus activities for reducing greenhouse gas emissions while in the longer term afforestation reforestation activities are believed to offer the largest potential unfortunately climate change is affecting forests in very unpredictable ways which may reduce their ability to mitigate future uh, future future climate change Complicating Red Plus implementation is its governance, which is distributed across a complex landscape of institutions with different sources of authority and power dynamics that influence its outcomes. Red Plus presents, represents only a partial solution to its climate change mitigation. Given the magnitude and main sources of emissions, forests can only be one part of the solution. Tackling the principle sources of emissions such as transport and, and energy and, uh, and those sectors remains the most effective way of ensuring lasting climate change mitigation. The available evidence indicates that the impacts of red plus interventions on biodiversity, as well as on livelihoods and other economic and social outcomes are uneven and often highly context dependent. Where benefits are clearly visible to local stakeholders and community engagement is strong, projects have achieved positive carbon and social outcomes, at least in the short term. However, challenges around monitoring and valuation of environmental and social outcomes of Red Plus limits our ability to fully assess these impacts. Over the years, better quantification of forest and carbon changes have, have been enabled by significant technological improvements, but the measurement, reporting, and verification of both carbon and non-carbon outcomes still needs to be improved in a number of ways. Interest in forests as nature-based solutions has probably never been higher, with multiple initiatives aimed at conserving, sustainably managing, and restoring forests. 
Such in initiatives contribute to Red Plus, but also overlap with it. The lessons from other initiatives, from these other initiatives, may prove useful to Red Plus and vice versa. So I, I think with that, um, I'll stop. As I said, these these general um, overarching um, conclusions will be elaborated on further in, in the next by the next uh, set of speakers. Thank you. Thank you very much, John, uh, and thank you for nicely setting the scene for the following presentations and discussions. As you said, uh, we will go into detail now, and I would now like to introduce our next speaker, Constance McDermott. She's an associate professor at the University of Oxford, and Professor McDermott will share with us insights into the evolving governance of Red Plus. Connie, you have the floor, please. Thank you, Christoph. So we started this report's empirical analysis by examining the governance of Red Plus. And the reason for this is that in order to understand progress in Red Plus, we first need to define what Red Plus actually is. Now, why would this be difficult? Global rulemaking for Red Plus under the UNFCCC is largely completed. As of the writing of this report, there were 17 countries that had submitted national reports on their Red Plus results to the UNFCCC. In other words, these countries have entered more or less phase three of results-based Red Plus. So in one sense, it might seem that Red Plus has become very well-defined and is proceeding according to plan. But if you start asking questions about how Red Plus has impacted forest loss, where and how, and who is paying for it, or what it means for the Red Plus safeguards that aim to ensure positive outcomes for people in biodiversity, then the picture is much more complex. So I'd like to highlight a few major trends with So multilateral finance for Red Plus has struggled to generate even a small fraction of the 30 billion or so US dollars per year once estimated as key to having deforestation by 2030. Countries though have pursued a variety of strategies for Red Plus. And it's important to remember that many of these have not relied on international finance, at least directly. These tend to reflect the particular political priorities or development strategies of the actors involved. At the same time, and as supported by decisions made within the UNFCCC, UNFCCC, there's also been a broad and expanding array of international finance and market-based strategies to address deforestation. Each of these can be viewed as different sources of authority in Red Plus, and that each may add their own rules for participation. They entail different reporting requirements, different processes for accessing funds, and different approaches to safeguards. They include not only multilateral finance, such as the UNFCCC's Green Climate Fund and various World Bank funds, but also voluntary carbon markets, commitments by corporate and government actors to zero deforestation supply chains, and a plethora of public and private carbon offsetting schemes. Some of these approaches, approaches may be formally integrated into national Red Plus strategies, as some of the RK studies illustrated. So this kind of efforts to assess the impact of Red Plus on forest cover, let alone its impact on forest governance, social welfare, and biodiversity. Meanwhile, the complex landscape of international finance, carbon markets, trade prohibitions, and development aid is not particularly transparent or accountable to the forest communities affected by it. It's very hard for anyone to follow, um, even if that's their, their main occupation, let alone a remote forest community. So making Red Plus legible to foreign governments or private investors does generate demand for transparency and accountability to those external actors, but that is a very different thing than transparency for local communities, and we need to remember that. So as Red Plus has progressed towards its original objective of be, being a results-based strategy that links economic incentives to measurable emissions reduction, this places very strong priority on measuring carbon, but there are no equivalent performance requirements for environmental and social safeguards, nor the same financial incentives. So for example, during the Green Climate Fund pilot phase for results-based payments, countries were required to provide only provide information on their safeguards and the receiving of funds was not contingent on the effectiveness of those safeguards. So meanwhile, the total amount of the money generated for Red, Plus for Red Plus, sorry, continues to be dwarfed by the value of trade and investments in the agricultural commodities driving deforestation. At the same time, large numbers of indigenous and local communities continue to lack secure rights to their land and resources, and this leaves them vulnerable to displacement by land speculators and agro-industry. So inclusion, in conclusion, Red Plus 
appeared in the start as a very simple idea to pay for reducing forest loss while safeguarding biodiversity and local communities. But in practice, the governance of Red Plus is subject to complex multi-level power dynamics. So it is critical that we continue to monitor these dynamics and examine the evidence for what approaches do or do not reduce forest loss and respect the Red Plus safeguards. Importantly, this means not allowing concerns about generating finance to overshadow the environmental and social objectives the finance is intended to serve and giving adequate attention to supporting the agency and welfare of local actors. Approach in this way, Red Plus has valuable lessons to offer about how to build more inclusive approaches to governing the world's forests. Thank you. Thank you very much, Connie, and for giving us this insight into this complex landscape that is governing the implementation of Red Plus and, and this uh, quite complicated dynamics behind. Um, now we are going to our next speaker. Uh, our next speaker is Marieke Sandker. Dr. Sandker is an expert on forest carbon and related monitoring and reporting, and will now present the outcomes and influences of Red Plus implementation on carbon. Marieke, you have the floor, please. Thank you very much. Um, yes, so my name is Marike Sandker, and together with my colleague Emily Donegan, I was lead authoring this chapter on Red Plus and Carbon. So in my daily life, I coordinate MRV support on Red Plus at FAO, but the contribution to this chapter was in uh, my personal capacity. Now, as John already mentioned, the importance of forests for the climate is undisputed. They absorb approximately 11 gigatons of CO2 equivalent each year as they grow which is, as mentioned before, 30% of the annual anthropogenic CO2 emissions. On the other hand, their conversion and degradation emits an estimated four gigatons of CO2 equivalent per year, or 10% of the annual anthropogenic CO2 emissions. Now, Red Plus provides the opportunity to reinforce forest contribution to climate change by reducing emissions from deforestation and forest degradation on one hand, and enhancing the sink function of forests through the plus on the other side. To date, 17 countries reported a total of 11.4 gigatons of CO2 equivalent of red plus results achieved between 2006 and 2020 to the UNFCCC, or on average um, 0.8 gigatons of CO2 equivalent per year. Now, more than 95% of the REP plus report results reported so far are from deforestation. In addition, literature also suggests that on the short term, the largest mitigation potential from REP plus lies in reducing emissions from deforestation. Therefore, the analysis in this chapter focuses on um, deforestation. Now, we first looked at the trend in global deforestation comparing country reported statistics uh, with Earth observations from two global products. This analysis suggests that the deforestation has been reduced globally. The question now remains is how much of this reduction can be attributed to Red Plus? Now, it's really hard to get a very clear answer on that, as the cause effect relation between Red Plus and reduced deforestation is very complicated. But we try to get a sense of Red Plus impact by dividing countries into two groups one which submitted a REP plus reference level to EU and FTT, and the other group countries that did not. And ac accordingly, we evaluated deforestation trends in both groups. So for that analysis, we used the country reported data to the FAO's FRA, and on the other hand, the GRC's Tropical Moist Forest Product, which is a Landsat-based analysis of deforestation and forest degradation globally. Now, using the fraud data, the results showed that of the, the, um, the Red Plus group, 46% of the countries saw a decline in deforestation over the past year, whereas in the non-Red Plus group, only 16% of the countries saw a decline. Now, interestingly enough, when this analysis was repeated using the Earth observation data, the difference was much sharper. So in this data, we saw a decline in deforestation over the past 10 years for 85% of the Red Plus countries against only 33% of the non-Red Plus countries. When we weight this uh, analysis by area, the effect of Red Plus is le less clear. And the results also differ substantially when comparing different periods to evaluate the reduction. So in conclusion, it seems that Red Plus is having a positive impact on reducing emissions from deforestation, but the magnitude of this impact is still quite hard to determine. 
What we can also see is that countries are making a lot of progress in improving data quality for rep reporting over time. Measurement, reporting, and verification of carbon outcomes of REP Plus is extremely complicated, but it's crucial to take the pulse of nature-based contributions to climate change mitigation. Thank you very much, Marik, for sharing your findings and also for highlighting these complexities of measuring, reporting, and verifying carbon outcomes of REP Plus, which is really um, not easy. Our next speakers, Valerie Kepos and Bas Kavira, will now explain the influences of REP Plus implementation on biodiversity, livelihoods, and well being. Dr. Kepos leads the Climate Change and Biodiversity Program at UNEP WCMC. And Professor Vera is the head of the Department of Geography at the University of Cambridge. Well, and Baska, you have the floor, please. Thanks very much. I'm up first, and I'll, I'll talk you through a little bit about um, what we did for this chapter and some of the challenges we met, which were quite similar to some of the challenges that were met in the carbon and in the governance discussions. Um, so from very early on in Red Plus, it was anticipated that Red Plus would help would contribute not only to reducing emissions and help therefore to contribute to climate mitigation, but that it would also have, make major global contributions to biodiversity conservation and to improving human well-being through contributions to livelihoods and so on. Um, and that anticipation, that expectation continues and indeed it's grown much more common or much more important um, internationally, we see growing emphasis on these so-called non-carbon benefits of Red Plus in, in policy, it's emphasized in the Paris Agreement and in subsequent UNFCCC documents. It came up in discussion in Glasgow. And we also see it in the context of financing for Red Plus, that financial, the, the uh, Green Climate Fund and growing carbon markets all have interest in these sometimes referred to co-benefits or non-carbon benefits of Red Plus. The challenge though, as we discovered in looking into this, is that the solid evidence to show exactly how these benefits are being achieved is somewhat lacking. At the moment, um, the evidence remains largely circumstantial. A lot of it is based on, particularly for biodiversity, and, and Basker will tell us more about the, um, the social and social and economic impacts. Um, but a lot of the evidence that we're um, that we're finding is still based on locations of efforts, the the understanding, which is a perfectly valid ecological understanding, that holding on to forests should help hold on to biodiversity, and to ecosystem, the ecosystem many ecosystem services that forests provide. But what we find is that there's very little monitoring of those outcomes. So we made an effort to look all the way across the full, um, if you like, project cycle, although project might not be the right word, initiative cycle for Red Plus implementation, checking principally the peer-reviewed literature. And we find that Red Plus efforts tend not to set very specific biodiversity objectives. They tend to set very broad ones. And this is one of the reasons that monitoring is quite difficult because biodiversity is a large and complex thing and monitoring the whole of it is quite challenging. We also find um, that there's an enormous work on planning for these multiple benefits, for non-carbon benefits. And you would expect that, especially given the emphasis on safeguards that we've heard from Connie and the role of non-carbon benefits in the safeguards themselves. Um, a lot of that planning is spatial planning. It holds great promise and it shows us where Red Plus can potentially achieve a lot of impact. What we don't see so much is we don't see targeted biodiversity monitoring. And we don't, and as a consequence, we don't see a lot of concrete evidence for biodiversity outcomes. We see evidence for forest being retained, as Marika mentioned. We see evidence, or we, we understand that the biodiversity associated with forests remains, but we don't yet see confirmed evidence of biodiversity impacts specifically from Red Plus. It doesn't mean they're not there. They're almost certainly there and positive. There are some risks as well, which we go into in the chapter, but the challenges associated with monitoring both biodiversity and ecosystem services 
align with differences in capacity and disciplines between those professionals dealing with carbon and those dealing with the other objectives of RED. And they very particularly line up with the need to monitor longer term and to show impact and to understand what would have happened without RED plus intervention. And for biodiversity, we're struggling to do that even more than we're struggling to do it for carbon. We see positive, some evidence of positive impacts, of course, on both biodiversity and ecosystem services, but we've made quite a strong argument in the chapter of the importance of extending that monitoring effort. I'm going to hand over to Baska to talk about the socioeconomic side of things. Thanks, uh, Val. Um, so just picking up on that thread, um, I'll, I'll sort of comment a little bit about something that uh, Connie mentioned, which is about uh, performance requirements in a number of Red Plus interventions, which have not necessarily required reporting on social and livelihood outcomes to the extent that they were required in terms of carbon outcomes. So that does mean that the evidence that we're looking at becomes more difficult to summarize or synthesize. Uh, what we tried to do was obviously to look, there's been a proliferation over the last decade of case studies uh, specifically focusing on the outcomes of Red Plus interventions on local communities. That's been uh, a, a bit of a cottage industry in terms of the number of studies that we can, we can find, but they're not done necessarily using similar methodologies. They're not necessarily using similar approaches in terms of measurement and monitoring. And the question of attribution that Marika pointed to in relation to carbon is enhanced even more when we're looking at social and livelihood outcomes. So while change might be documented, attributing that change solely to the intervention to red plus is very difficult given the data that's available so with that very substantial caveat what we were trying to do was to look at that evidence and to try and see what it tells us about the impacts that um, often project level interventions have specifically had on local communities uh, in terms of social and livelihood outcomes um, it's very mixed um, it often depends on local project specific uh, variables and context dependent issues. Uh, but there are a few general lessons that we try and draw. Um, a number of things reinforce other work which looks at social outcomes from forest interventions. Um, the importance of participation of local social groups, uh, if that has been explicitly taken into account in the design of a Red Plus intervention, that shows positive outcomes. If that's not been designed in, then there tends to be the risk of excluding local communities. Um, the important lessons there is the extent to which at design stage, these issues have been explicitly targeted as opposed to being expected to follow uh, when a Red Plus intervention takes place. Um, what is the extent to which governance support has been provided to local participatory institutions? How much has the new governance regime actually taken into account the existing governance structures that might already exist for the management of local forests? Um, to what extent are the safeguards actually being adhered to? And what were the socioeconomic conditions prior to the Red Plus intervention? Those become very influential in determining the outcomes. Um, I'll focus in very briefly on three specific issues that the chapter does highlight. One is to do with inequality. Uh, the other is to do with the role, role of indigenous peoples and local communities. And finally, uh, some issues around land tenure and uh, rights. Um, now, as I've already mentioned, uh, Red Plus projects have tended to reduce inequality or increase representation only in the circumstances where the projects have explicitly focused on these issues through very clear articulation of these objectives and through an emphasis on monitoring and having indicators to demonstrate that these are positive outcomes. Otherwise, there's a risk that projects can reinforce existing inequalities simply through neglect. They haven't paid attention to the inequality question and as a result, risk reinforcing existing power dynamics. So it needs to be designed in. That's the sort of key takeaway message. Um, the role of indigenous peoples and local communities has been highlighted in a lot of interventions around forest and land use recently, including most recently in the upcoming meetings uh, of, of our parallel conventions around, around uh, uh, in the UNCCD meetings, which are about to take place next week. Um, the importance is partly because they are particularly vulnerable to the impacts of climate change uh, the importance of their traditional knowledge systems is emphasized, and they are often the most vulnerable in terms of living in extreme poverty. Yeah. Evidence suggests that a substantial proportion of forest carbon is in lands that are managed and controlled by indigenous peoples and local communities. And there's no clear evidence that these have necessarily been included in design so far. 
And once again, it's really important not to risk exclusion. We have some evidence from some case studies that the neglect of these issues has resulted in the exclusion of indigenous peoples in local communities. But if they can be designed in, there is evidence in other areas that um, positive outcomes can be achieved. Um, similarly with land tenure, there are some examples, for example, from Brazil and Indonesia, where recognition of land rights has led to positive outcomes. But in other places, Tanzania, Thailand, where villages are being relocated or evicted as a consequence of Red Plus. So again, a very mixed picture. And I guess I would re-emphasize two important messages. One is uh, the importance of taking these issues into account at design stage. Social and livelihood issues need to be explicitly focused on. And secondly, the importance of monitoring and reporting on social and livelihood outcomes as a, as a part of the monitoring and reporting processes. Thank you. Thank you very much, Wellen Besker, for highlighting these very important aspects of REPLUS implementation. Uh, I'm sure we'll have a discussion on that later on. Uh, last but not least, uh, our author, Stephanie Mansourian, will now present findings of the analysis of REPLUS challenges and the respective lessons learned in our assessment. Dr. Mansourian is an environmental consultant, and she's also a UFRO Deputy Task Force Coordinator. Stephanie, you have the floor, please. Thank you, Krista. So firstly, I'd like to acknowledge my co-authors, Amy Duchel, Cesar Sabogal, and Bas Gavira. Um, Amy and Cesar are in the audience, so you can pick on them for any questions um, live. Um, so in this chapter, we sought to identify some of the main challenges that have emerged in relation to Red Plus in the last 10 years. We also looked at lessons that are being learned from experiences in Red Plus. And one dimension we also wanted to explore was any exchange or cross-fertilization between Red Plus and forest landscape restoration. The reason being that restoration of carbon stocks is one of the activities under Red Plus, but at the same time, forest landscape restoration has grown in significantly in popularity in recent years. So what did we find? Our analysis yielded nine overarching challenges and nine lessons. We organized the challenges in three categories. Firstly, management or technical challenges um, that relate to things such as methodologies, definitions, or operationalizing Red Plus. So for example, different guidance related to safeguards across different agencies can be confusing and adds to complexity in project development. Secondly, we identified a series of financial challenges. For example, we identified the need to make the business case for Red Plus. Ultimately, Red Plus interventions may be competing for land with what are perceived as more profitable activities, such as production of various cash crops. Incentives contribute to this imbalance, and thus Red Plus requires addressing some of these imbalances if it is to be financially attractive. Thirdly, we identified institutional challenges. For example, cross-sectoral coordination is a challenge in many countries. Forests intersect with mining and agriculture, for example, and seeking to achieve the aims of Red Plus may be obstructed by priorities in these other sectors. Attempts to address this have been made through, for example, the creation of a Red Plus body at the national level that seeks to coordinate across ministries. Um, through an established national Red Plus committee, for example. In this chapter, we also looked at lessons learned from Red Plus implementation and identified nine lessons. Uh, they include, for example, the need to address the drivers of deforestation and forest degradation, addressing land and forest ownership, as well as accountability of in-country stakeholders, understanding power relations among different actors and recognizing the importance of non-carbon benefits among others. I'm not going to go into all the detail. You can find that in the chapter. Now, just a few words to say that we also explored, um, as I said, how some of these challenges and lessons applied to forest landscape restoration and vice versa, how some of the lessons um, that came out that are coming out of forest landscape restoration implementation can be useful to Red Plus. We found that there are some issues that were relevant and important to both, such as strengthening collaboration across different sectors and across different stakeholders, considering both Western and non-Western knowledge and implementation, and the need for effective monitoring. There are significant opportunities for Red Plus going forward. 
Firstly, it may serve to promote synergies and collaboration across the main environmental conventions. Secondly, the time is right for greater private sector involvement in Red Plus, and this may lead to additional funding, but more importantly, to addressing some of the underlying drivers of forest loss and degradation. Thirdly, improved technology is helping gather real-time and accurate data on forest change. In conclusion, and in light of the various commitments and interests in forests, notably through nature-based solutions, forest landscape restoration, net zero commitments, etc., Red Plus can add value to these diverse forest-related interventions and maybe serve as an umbrella to regroup many of these initiatives. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Stephanie, for this excellent overview of the challenges and lessons learned uh, in Red Plus implementation. Uh, all these findings uh, you heard now in the presentations of our authors, they are all in our uh, report that will be available or is already available on our, our website and um, is being published at the moment. Uh, we will now just start the discussion and address your questions. Again, please um, post your question to the speakers in the Q&A box if you're online or yes, raise your hand if you're on site. My colleague Gerda Wolfram will then hand over a microphone to selected speakers. Um, so I take a look if there's already a question in there. Um, I would like to start with a question that I have here uh, on tenure rights. Um, uh, since tenure rights are weak um, in many regions, but are critical for the distribution of benefits, has Red Plus any specific measures aiming to clarify uh, tenure rights before the implementation of Red Plus related activities. I think uh, I would direct this question to Bhaskar, who has been working on that. Uh, could you please respond, Bhaskar? Yeah, sure. Um, so, and Connie might want to come in on this as well, because partly it's about yes. how, how these are, uh, th these interventions are actually governed and, and designed rather than uh, the monitoring. So uh, I think, as I said, the, there are no explicit prerequisites for um, interventions to look at tenure, but where they have done, uh, they have tended to, um, to result in positive outcomes because they're taking into account local tenure arrangements. Um, the difficulty is that there isn't an explicit requirement to do so. We already know that the question of tenure around land and forest is highly contested in many local jurisdictions. Um, and given the existing power imbalances, uh, large scale intervention like Red Plus can risk reinforcing some of those inequalities in terms of access. So the, the, I mean, the short answer is that it's not required. So as a result, there's a sort of governance question around what is required in order to have a, a, a program approved. Um, where, it is, where it has been taken into account proactively, there is some evidence that you can have positive outcomes. If it's neglected, there's a high risk that you can actually reinforce existing inequalities. Thank you very much. Connie, do you, much, but, Connie, yeah, do you want Bhaskar. to add anything to that? Yes, please, Connie. Well, I think Bhaskar uh, made some excellent points. And I think the issue of, of land tenure and land rights is, is what you could call a, a major underlying, um, well, it can be a driver of forest change, but also a major underlying challenge um, that Red Plus faces in many forest frontier areas where tenure is often insecure. And I think there, there is not necessarily a lot of evidence, although there have been, has been research um, looking into this, that, um, that the presence of Red Plus um, necessarily uh, leads you know, to incentivizing the um, clarification of tenure, although I think that varies by country. Um, and the other thing to keep in mind is that clarifying tenure for the purpose of, let's say, um, results-based payments for communities may not may influence how that tenure is distributed and may not necessarily benefit the poorest members of the community um, and those who who have you know are aren't able to prove their their land rights. So I think it, this also kind of speaks to a, note, a question I noticed in the Q&A about um, why bother with, or, or should we be distracted by, you know, the sort of social and environmental dimensions of Red Plus and why complicate this, you know, Red Plus, which is really initially intended to be about carbon. I mean, one answer to that is simply that 
um, I think despite a lot of um, opinions in, in the beginning that, that we should just focus on carbon, um, when you hit the ground, when you need to work with um, you know, particular communities and actors, et cetera, the politics um, enters into it uh, pretty much unavoidably. So, and tenure is sort of at the heart of that. I mean, who has rights to the land, let alone to the carbon? All of these things cannot easily be ignored. And, and if you do ignore them, you know, it can come in a political cost. So I think, you know, it is a, it is a complex challenge, but, um, you know, that, that's, that's why we're in, the, in this situation in the first place. And I think um, there is a widespread um, observations in the literature, as, as Bosker was saying, that, you know, that, that sort of clarify or, or addressing the tenure issue is not really an option, an optional issue for, for um, addressing deforestation in the long run. Thanks. Thank you very much, Connie, and also thank you for already responding to one other question in the Q&A box. Uh, I do have one now on, on the carbon reporting. Um, there's a question, why do we need to pursue a REPLUS reporting on carbon when countries at the same time are obliged to report to UNFCCC on LULUCF? Um, may I ask Marieke to take on this question? Yes, thank you very much. Uh, that's an excellent question. So yes, in theory, you would expect that to be more or less similar. Uh, in practice, I mean, countries plus reporting can be more narrow than um, LULUCF reporting on the UNFCCC. Also, the objective is different. Uh, REP plus reporting usually is in the context of obtaining uh, finance for um, for results. So therefore, countries can choose to align the, um, the scope of the activities they report on uh, with, for example, the activities they target through their REP plus strategy. So that might make that they are, the, the reporting is uh, targeting less activities than the LULUCF broader reporting. Also, LULUCF uh, seeks to, uh, to be as complete as possible. So, so if a country doesn't have uh, high quality data, they can, uh, you know, IPCC suggests them to use tier one default values, which, um, you know, for Red Plus reporting, given that it's in the context of receiving finance, uh, some countries may feel like, look, that's not what we want to do. We only want to uh, report on the, the, the high quality data where we are certain that we are making an impact. So there's some, some nuances, uh, there's some differences between those two reporting streams. Thank you very much, Marieke. Um, I would like to ask my colleague Gerda, is there anybody raising hands uh, on site? Yes, there yes, is. Several. Yes, Could then I please, I would like to take a question from the audience on site. Can maybe come to the microphone? Thank you. I think there were two questions. There was yes, there. please. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, I may have missed the, 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 the that part of the presentation. Uh, my question is related to returns from uh, whether in the studies you actually looked at the financial returns from Red Plus. When we all started on this, we were expecting to get a lot of money from the carbon. And from the report that uh, there is reduced uh, deforestation in Red Plus areas, was this also accompanied by increased returns for those countries where there was evidence of reduced uh, deforestation? And did you do any comparison with the cost of readiness, where especially we've had a lot of investment in the red readiness, and how did that compare with the returns? Thank you. Actually, Peter, for the benefit of the participants, maybe you can identify yourself. Uh, sorry. Yeah. Uh, I'm Peter Gondo from the United Nations Forum on Forest Secretariat. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Peter, for this excellent question. Um, I think I would again start with Pascar. Maybe you were working on the finance background of REPLUS implementation. So, yeah, no, thank you for the question. Now, um, you made a sort of uh, distinction between the readiness phase and the implementation phase. And I think for those who are aware of the way in which Red Plus has been, has been implemented, uh, finance was distributed in different stages uh, and getting countries 
to be ready for the implementation is the readiness phase. And then some countries have progressed to the actual implementation phase, but actually a very small number. So we're, we're still at the stage where we are, a lot of the funds that have been disbursed are getting countries ready to implement projects. Uh, there is a very small number of countries that are currently in the implementation phase. We've got a summary of this in the table. In terms of the impact, it's very difficult to say at this stage. It is really literally too early to say because a lot of the dis distribution for implementation is taking place too soon to attribute any real outcomes. So funds have been disbursed. That there is evidence of. What impact they've had, it's very difficult to say. I Thank you very much. Addresses and, yeah. Yeah. Is it, does anybody of the other authors and speakers wants to add anything? Well, I, I mean, I could add something. I think as, as I touched on in my uh, talk, I mean, there's no question that the amount of funds dispersed, especially um, sort of through national governments has been far short of the amount that was estimated would be required to cover the opportunity costs of, of slowing deforestation. I mean, that's sort of a, a simple answer. Of course, the reality is much more complex than that, but, but certainly the expectations, for example, in the Elias report that there would be 17 to 33 billion um, US dollars per year allocated for Red Plus has not materialized, certainly not in, in that form. Um, so, and, and those funds that have been promised have been often very slow to be dispersed for all kinds of reasons. And also, as, as I was thinking, I was mentioning, I mean, a lot of governments have, um, Red Plus governments have invested their own money in, in trying to get um, prepared for Red Plus. In terms of, and maybe Marieke has something to say about this, but in, in terms of the sort of funds dispersed for results-based payments, um, those, for a lot of reasons, but those really don't match the results either in the sense that only a, a fraction of the actual reported results have, have been received you know, in payments. So for example, through the Green Climate Fund. I mean, it, there's lots of reasons for that. So it's, it's not a simple case of you know, the international community not paying up, it's more than that. But, but still, um, I think there, there is this sense that, that the funds have not materialized the way that, that was anticipated in the beginning. Thank you very much, Connie. Yeah. Sure. Um, I think we could take one more question from the floor on site in the audience. Thank you. Um, my name is Felicity Lacane. I work for the UK government on Red Plus, and thank you so much for a really interesting set of presentations. And I look forward to reading the report. Um, I had a couple of questions, but as you have said I can ask one. Um, I'm here representing a, 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 a country that uh, contributes a lot of, um, or relatively, our official development assistance budget towards Red Plus programming internationally. Um, and we're currently thinking through uh, what should our priorities as a, a donor um, and someone who partners with a lot of Red Plus countries be for the next few years. Um, you've, you've given an overview of lots of the lessons learned and, and it's a kind of particularly the last speaker. It's a very familiar list of priorities and challenges for Red Plus um, at a high level. Be interested if, if any of you have, have specific recommendations or reflections on the role of donors, um, how donors have influence for better or worse, the trajectory that Red Plus has gone on um, and what we should be thinking about in terms of our role in this landscape in the next few years. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much for this excellent question. Um, Stephanie, would you like to start in responding, please? Thank you. Yes, well, um, I think, I guess like a lot of the challenges that we're facing in, in a lot of the other forest related um, interventions, collaboration across different donors would be a top priority to see how um, to optimize funding and also optimize things like um, safeguards that are being pushed by different agencies, et cetera. So one of the conclusions we can say that came out of this is, is very much this, this necessity to promote collaboration so as to facilitate implementation and not, not add to the burden that countries are facing um, 
Now, I know that's easier said than done, and, and in some ways, 10 years is early days for, for such a, a, a large program and uh, with potentially massive impact. But um, I think now the time, that, you know, one of our conclusions is now the time is right for that. So um, mm -hmm. I would definitely say that's one of the top priorities. Thank you very much, Stephanie. Uh, anybody of the others want to add on? Yes, please. Well. Once I've found the mute button. Um, I think it's a great question, and I think Stephanie's was a great answer, but I would also like to promote the idea that donors can help to foster collaboration within countries and between sectors. Uh, this was a, a really strong emerging message from the talks in Glasgow, the, the really important need to coordinate um, and try to meet the needs of multiple sectors in the way we decide on Red Plus and other climate related action. And I think that is something donors can encourage. I don't think they can dictate it, and I don't think they should dictate it, but I do think that they can incentivize it. And we, you know, we see this in a sort of basic way through some of the premium, for, for example, through the um, Green Climate Fund premium for non-carbon benefits. But there's, there's a mechanism that needs to go behind that or underneath it um, so that it isn't just lip service and so that those involved in setting red policy and action are drawing on the expertise and the opinions available from other sectors. And I think there's a level at which donors can help to s encourage, support, perhaps incentivize that. And I'd like to see that come higher up the agenda. Thank you. Thank you very much, Will. Um, I, we would have several more questions, but unfortunately we have to move on in the program. We're a bit late already. Uh, thank you very much uh, for your excellent questions, all of you. I have to close this discussion now, but I would like to ask our speakers and authors to respond to the question in the Q&A by writing, if you feel so. Um, and we will, with that, come to the second part of our event. Uh, it's also an important uh, part because it highlights the views from stakeholders in REPLUS implementation, and we will discuss that. Uh, first, we will hear opinion, opinions of local and national stakeholders, and um, we will start um, the, uh, with a presentation of stakeholder views from Asia and Latin America. And for that, actually, I will hand over to my colleague, uh, Dr. Nelson Grima, who manages this project for the GFAP program. Uh, Nelson, you have the floor, please. Thank you, Christoph. Uh, as you mentioned, back to back with the scientific assessment, stakeholder consultations were carried out in Asia and Latin America, uh, aiming to know the perspective of uh, Red Plus implementation on the ground, and also to identify factors that need to be improved in future Red Plus activities. Nearly 200 stakeholders were interviewed in 14 countries and regions, and in each one of these regions, stakeholders from civil society groups, policymakers, academia, the private sector, international and regional organizations, and other social groups of interest were represented. Despite the contextual differences uh, in each region and country, the stakeholders identified social, economic, environmental governance and technical factors that could be addressed to improve Red Plus implementation. Uh, a standalone uh, report is being prepared, uh, which will compile and analyze the comments received during the consultations. Uh, this report will be ready towards the end of the year. However, uh, to introduce some of the outcomes, we asked some of the experts that conducted the consultations on the ground to summarize the responses they received. The following video is a brief summary of their work. And if you have any questions, uh, as before, please write them in the Q&A box after the video. Video, please. Can Red Plus become a mechanism to protect these trees? 
so that they store carbon for a longer period of time. While conducting the stakeholder consultation process, two things emerged. Number one, people really want land rights to be settled first before investing in red plus like mechanisms. In Indian context, unless until we solve the rights of the people on ground, it's very difficult for Red Plus to make any credible change in the lives of people or protect forests for a longer period of time. Policymakers see this report as a tool to change national forest policy and the National Climate Action Plan, which is a great achievement for this report and it might contribute in sustenance of forests for a longer period of time. If we really want uh, Red Plus to make a change on ground, first thing people said, we need to de demystify it. Demystification of Red Plus include bringing clarity on the Red Plus term, removing the technical jargon, and connecting these terms to local people's livelihoods and making them clear to public so that they also participate equally in such kind of initiatives on ground. One thing that came out from this stakeholder consultation process was that in India, if we really want to make Red Plus a successful initiative, we first need to tackle the tenurial rights of thousands of forest dwelling and indigenous communities. We have to involve these communities right from the planning stage to implementation and then monitoring as these communities depend on forests for their daily livelihoods needs. Even the fund flow mechanism under Red Plus need to be directly channelized to village level institutions so that they make sure that such funds are equally distributed among all sections of the society, especially the vulnerable sections. Reducing emissions from deforestation and forest degradation. Uh, this uh, financial mechanism can help Malaysian government to conserve its remaining forest. So the state government in Malaysia, as well as the federal government, they have different policies and different uh, implementation strategies. So sometimes the implementation of uh, policies, it differs between federal government and the state government. So if we have, uh, if we have this situation, it will affect the implementation of Red Plus initiatives uh, towards conserving forest resources. They also commented on indigenous communities. So they asked uh, some questions, how these indigenous communities will be involved in Red Plus initiatives and what incentives uh, indigenous communities will receive and how these incentives or benefits will be distributed and what would be the land tenure, uh, land tenureship enhancement for these indigenous communities. So it means that we need to solve all this issue if we want to involve indigenous communities in Red Plus initiatives. They also commented on oil palm plantations. So they said uh, oil palm plantations already enclosed uh, many uh, thousand hectares of uh, forest land in Malaysia. So they commented that uh, apart from further expansion of uh, oil palm in forest areas is better to concentrate on increasing the productivity of existing oil palm plantations. Experts believe that uh, there is a mismatch in Malaysia uh, regarding planning, uh, large scale uh, infrastructure development. And previously, uh, due to unplanned uh, infrastructure development in Malaysia, it caused huge forest fragmentation. So they suggested to prioritize uh, this long-term uh, planning and projects in order to conserve forest resources. Experts also talk about economics of Red Plus. So they commented that the financial mechanism should be clearly spelled out so that everybody can see very clearly 
what are the benefits that are coming from red plus activities and it is very important uh, to provide evidence that the economy that will coming from red plus will be as high as that uh, state government are currently uh, getting from timber harvesting and other forest products extraction otherwise it will be difficult uh, to convince the state government to adopt red plus initiatives and there are some other factors that experts uh, pointed out so for example we can say uh, about the knowledge of red plus so general people local communities and even uh, forestry officials that don't have clear understanding what is red plus and how it is related to climate change or forest conservation so it means that we need to communicate with proper knowledge among the major uh, among the majority of the people so that they can understand and they can support red plus initiatives and finally experts commented that the technical terms that we use in red plus is very uh, difficult to understand by the common people even uh, forestry staff so it means that the literature on red plus should be easily understandable so that uh, people can easily understand and they can implement uh, the red plus initiatives in the real field so experts believe that uh, if we address all these factors in malaysian context and uh, try to implement uh, red plus initiatives uh, through multi stakeholder approach so it will uh, bring some positive outcomes in terms of forest conservation in malaysia uh, helping malaysian government to achieve net zero uh, greenhouse gas emissions target by 2050 as well as uh, to improve the livelihoods of forest dependent communities including indigenous people The report, according to the stakeholders that were consulted, can contribute in modifying Red Plus implementation plans to avoid failure in the future as there were disappointments over the previous implementation of deforestation on the ground. One respondent mentioned that the key findings of the GFE based assessment, uh, particularly complexities, areas to improve, uncertainties, and many others. are essential inputs in crafting policies responsive to the present situation in government the findings from chief's assessment can also contribute in influencing communities to plant trees with deforestation being considered an important strategy to mitigate climate change in addition the report is also viewed to contribute to current philippine efforts related to completing its readiness phase implementing red plus as well as in its forest and landscape restoration related initiatives it was suggested that there should be one policy based on philippine national red plus strategy with findings from gis assessment report as inputs stakeholders also uh, view the use of this report as an important document that can be used in reinforcing the advocacy on forest restoration as an essential component in mitigating climate change and raising the awareness of local people to value forest as an important ecosystem and not only as something to be used the report can also be used in the development of technical bulletin as guideline in implementation of an improved version of a technic a red plus project a carbon measurement land use planning in local uh, government units and ensuring effective management of red plus projects the report can likewise be used to improve or refine policies and laws towards reducing deforestation and forest degradation future research agenda and as basis in retooling members of the people's organization to avoid hasty reforestation implementation that resulted to low survival of seedlings experiences lessons and findings are shown in the gips assessment report can be distilled and then used the best option for it plus uh, philippines to succeed when implemented in more strategic sites in the country 
The report can be used to support the policies to be developed in order to sustain lumber supply from production forest uh, under the sustainable forest management where harvesting is allowed. The report can likewise be used in identifying and planning additional support needed to achieve the Red Plus readiness phase. The information can provide uh, uh, information to donors and partners emphasizing their contribution in implementation of the Paris Agreement, particularly in their share in the nationally determined contribution. Poverty remains a major issue in upland communities where Red Plus projects are implemented. This is the reason why local people cut trees, douseless and burn farming, fuel wood gathering, make charcoals and other illegal activities for survival. Majority of these communities are still in survival mode and will always look at ways to find livelihoods even if it will lead to forest destruction. Most reforestation projects like previous Red Plus projects ended up in three years and after that people involved went back to their useful fuel wood gathering, timber poaching and other destructive activities. Red Plus projects should therefore, as respondents suggest, seriously consider sustainable long-term livelihoods if it wants to succeed in reforestation, biodiversity conservation, and carbon storage. There should be full-scale implementation of sustainable forest management and payment of ecosystem services like water, carbon, and others. To avoid further deforestation and forest degradation, as well as upscale the implementation of a new a few pilot model initiatives in the country. Clearer benefits sharing scheme among forest managers and other stakeholders should also be addressed. The incentive mechanism must be clearly understood looking at the extended cost benefit analysis of committing forest plants under Red Plus versus alternative uses to society and economy. These values need to be factored in the pricing formula and not only the value of carbon per hectare from it. It is important that people within poverty line would be able to escape from the cyclical economic problem and in this way pressure on forests will be reduced. There should be a seminar or series of seminars and capacity building activities to encourage them to find job opportunities like tree planting outside Red Plus projects. It was suggested that communities should learn new thinking of survival, widen their views by engaging in agricultural production, raise livestock, and plant trees to harvest in the future outside Red Plus areas. In essence, Red Plus projects should be holistic in its approach. The results of the interview show that there was a general agreement that this report make it possible to identify the challenges and pending gaps in the implementation of Red Plus in Chile through the provision of strategic information that can serve as input for the development of public policies. In the same area, stakeholders mentioned that they will use the information of this report in the academic as input for researchers in order to meet Chile's remaining challenges with Red Plus and to establish necessary local research priorities. Regarding social factors, most agree that an important factor to address is the involvement of local communities at the project formulation stage. Other social factors that were mentioned should be addressed. Rural poverty, temporality of work, low participation of women, and informality of local forest owner. Regarding economics factors, most stakeholders responded that more than economic factors, it is important to ensure or favor payments of different areas, for example, payments that ensure co-benefits and incentives 
to forest owners such as payments to maintain forests that cover the opportunity cost and thus prevent land use change. Or phones to act quickly or prevent threat. For example, to use part of the phones for forest fire prevention, among others. On the other hand, and regarding the environmental factors to be addressed, more than half of those interviewed responded that one of the most important factors to address is drought and water availability, as the country faces the worst water crisis in much of its territory. In addition, water is one of the most limiting environmental factors when establishing reforestation projects, especially because of the problem that exists in Chile today with water use rights. Other important issues to be addressed in future report including the following. Creating market mechanisms as Red Plus can work with the private sector to include them as mechanisms within its planning. And three financial strategies that allow Red Plus sustainability. Because forest investments are long term and face high opportunity costs compared to other alternative uses, such as agriculture or livestock. Finally, and by way of conclusion, in general, it was noted that the consultation served as an opportunity for different stakeholders to share their experience and opinion with the initiative. Among the opinions towards the project highlighted the good economic and environmental opportunities that Red Plus give to the country because they are not similar initiatives or public policies that pursue the same objective. And the plus is a uh, very important in uh, our forest uh, because they part of the forest ecosystems services, but have some opportunities to improve in the future. Promote that at less forty percent are women, and incorporate the stakeholders. Uh, according to country reality. For example, in uh, Costa Rica, it's very important the forest dragon, and include this uh, very good idea. Um, the include other um, environmental services um, paying for them will be very important in our case. Thank you. I'd like to highlight three interesting aspects of served in the stakeholders consultation Brazil. The first one is related to the diversity of the forest landscape that you have in your country, which demands different modalities of red place. In Brazil, Amazon holds almost part of the resources obtained from red place, which is completely plausible, given its biodiversity richness and its role in the global climate system. However, Brazil also has other biomes of great ecological and climatic relevance. The Cerrado and the Atlantic Forest, for example, are considered very important hotspots of biodiversity. However, these biomes have been suffering pressure from deforestation and forest degradation. The Atlantic Forest, in particular, after more than five centuries of exploration and landscape change, 
has only 7% of its forest remaining, which represents a huge demand for modalities of red flowers that consider restoration practices. The second point refers to the translation of the benefits obtained from red flowers into improving the quality of life in the places where projects are implemented. There is a huge demand for guidance on how best to invest these resources in quality goods, such as the improvement of local infrastructure, the local education system, or create new modalities of sustainable food production systems. In the same vein, funders and companies that work with Red Plus can support local communities on defining some priorities for investment. Thus, Red Plus could have a more positive and transformative impact on local communities involved. The last point is related to the impact of climate change on Red Plus projects. The occurrence of drought and increase in temperature has been intensified in several parts of Brazil, including the Amazon. During the stakeholders' consultation, some stakeholders highlighted how difficult it is to avoid the spread of fires in the forest. Today, forests seem to be more prone to the fires, especially to the understory fires. Some strategies to avoid this, this spread of fires involve the removal of vegetation at the edge of the forest. This practice has been intensified the edge effect, increased the forest flammability, the forest degradation, the carbon dioxide emission. A more flammable forest could represent a big challenge in the future of the Red Plus projects. Thus, Red Plus initiatives need to search for a better understanding of how climate change represents a big challenge in the future for conservation. Thank you. And after seeing this video, uh, I would like to ask the audience if anyone has any question, please post it now to the Q&A section or uh, if anyone on site has any question, please raise your hands. If there are no questions, uh, I would like to uh, repeat again that um, a summary of uh, these stakeholder consultations in both Asia and Latin America will be uh, compiled into a new publication that, of course, will be linked to the report we are presenting today, but it will be also a standalone publication. And we aim to have it ready by the end of the year. And it will be, uh, we hope it will be a uh, help for anyone interested on uh, Red Plus implementation on the ground to understand how these activities are seen for, from the point of view of different stakeholders. And if there are no questions, uh, I will give the floor back to Christoph. Christoph, please. Christoph, you're muted. Uh, uh, very sorry. <laughs> Now I, you should hear me, and I also apologize for the technical difficulties on site during uh, the showing of the video. I heard that there was no sound um, during one video. Um, thank you very much, Nelson, and also a special thanks to all our local experts who carried out this stakeholder consultation. These are very, uh, very useful. This very useful work and 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 very interesting outcomes. Um, in our final part of our event, we want now to hear how donors and rulemaking institutions see the REPLUS implementation and how they um, reflect on the outcomes of our report. And if there are already lessons learned from their view, 
Um, we will start with uh, Darinka Blis. Dr. Blis is representing the German Ministry for Development Cooperation, BMZ. Uh, BMZ is involved in Red Plus implementation since many years. And as you all know, Germany is one of the major Red Plus donors. Uh, BMZ is also funding the scientific work in our for Stiefel program, including our Red Plus study that we present today. Darinka, you have the floor, please. Thank you so much, uh, Christoph, for your, for your kind introduction. Um, before I start, let me first thank you all for, for inviting me to today's event. It was very enriching, at least the part that I attended. And I'm a bit sad that my background is plainly white and not a nice forest or green or any nice picture or something. Um, so, um, I would also like to congratulate uh, you, Yufu, and the Global Forest Expert Panel for this very important study, very, very important also for the work that, that we do at BMZ. And BMZ is very glad to have been supporting the development of this study through its strategic partnership with the Yufu. And um, the aim of this partnership was and is to strengthen the interface between science and policy and to provide the best available knowledge for, the, for us who are also working in the decision-making processes. Um, so the study comes right at, com comes at the right time, I have to say. And as the, dis the discussions on the future of Red Plus gain new momentum now and have gained momentum in the, in the recent past. And at COP26 in Glasgow last year, the forest and nature-based solutions took center stage and played a key role in climate discussions. And the record number of countries signed the Glasgow Leaders Declaration on Forest and Land Use to end the deforestation by um, uh, 2030. And a record amount of new forest finance was pledged in the end. So a key question is, what is or should be the role of Red Plus in implementing these targets? And the study on Red Plus here provides a large number of insights and many lessons learned that will help to answer this question with the ultimate aim to improve the effectiveness of Red Plus for climate, nature, and of course, people. Um, for more than a decade, German Development Corporation has been financing numerous Red Plus initiatives, so both bilateral and multilateral, such as the Forest Carbon Partnership Facility, FCPF, or the Red for Early Movers program, which was fine, um, which is financed jointly by Germany, Norway, and the UK, and is implemented in Ecuador, Colombia, and in Brazil. A study by the Institute for Development Evaluation, short DEVAL, um, in 2020 here in Germany, analyzed the achievements and the shortcomings of uh, specifically Germany's Red Plus engagement. And the summary, this study then recommended to further support Red Plus appro approaches while at the same time ensuring that the numerous challenges encountered in the past decades are addressed, for example, regarding the benefit sharing, the complex monitoring and the evaluation requirements, and also the need to move from project level implementation to jurisdictional approaches. And while this is in line with some of the key findings from the EFU study, I believe it will give us additional orientation for aspects to be included in our bilateral and multilateral initiatives. For example, the insights on the relevance of governance and power structures, as well as land tenure legit um, legitimacy mentioned in the report uh, seemed particularly relevant um, for, for the division that I work in and also for me personally, of course. Um, concluding, I'd like to stress one of the key findings of the study. We have to be aware of the fact that Red Plus is important, but surely not enough to conserve forests worldwide. Um, and in, in addition to Red Plus, we also have to directly address the drivers of deforestation and create an enabling environment for forest conservation together with our partner countries, of course. And to come to an end, once again, let me congratulate you for this study. Um, but let me also emphasize one point that from a policy and implementation perspective, um, there is a need for very clear science-based recommendations about how to improve things. I'm aware that it's uh, sometimes at odds with the analytical focus of science and particular challenge for the science policy interface. But um, I would really like to encourage you to be as brave as possible in this regard with formulating clear and concrete messages um, for practitioners and us, the policymakers, in the further dissemination of this study and also future studies 
well, of course, um, ensuring scientific foundation. So thank you very much for the floor and I give back to you. Thank you very much, Dorinka, for sharing a donor's perspective and for providing an insight into Germany's Red Plus work. Um, and our, of course, I also thank you very much for your support of, of IFRS work at the Science Policy Interface. And we will certainly also try um, to come up with the requests of, of, of implementers and donors that they need concrete recommendations. Um, as you already mentioned, it's always um, a fine line to stick to what we have as scientific evidence and to um, uh, not be to go too much into a more um, um, or to lose an objective perspective of that. But we definitely were working on, on it. The, the more uh, uh, evidence you have, the more concrete recommendations we can have. Um, with that, um, I'm coming to our last speaker today, uh, Dr. Dirk Nimitz, um, Nimitz, who will convey his view on the REPLUS implementation as a representative of the Secretariat of the Climate Convention and as team leader of its a follow agriculture, forestry, and land, other land use unit. Um, please, Dirk, uh, you have the floor now. Thank you, Christoph, and I hope you can hear me well. I can hear you well. Um, very good. Um, thank you for, for inviting me and adding this perspective from the UNFCC and from our work with countries directly. Um, I think the, the study itself and pulling all of this work together after 10 years of, or close to 10 years of REP plus implementation in line with the Warsaw framework is a very timely one. It's one that is really needed and we, we must uh, make use of the wealth of information that is there and on the lessons learned. So I can only um, join Darinka in congratulating you for um, taking on this effort and putting this out for everyone to read and to reflect on what needs to be done and what is next. It's also important when we are forward looking, when we are looking into what is needed by 2030, what have countries agreed at the Glasgow Declaration um, last year? And what does the IPCC say? And of course, forests can't do everything. We also have the Working Group 2 report that basically says, if energy emissions don't go down, then forests will do nothing because they will all burn down. and We will have much more emissions than removals from forests. Um, so it's, it's not to say that forest action can replace anything in any of the other uh, sectors, but it's an important contribution. And as we have heard a lot today, there's also lots of core benefits that can be had. Um, maybe on that, a personal reflection on the biodiversity aspect. I've, I've done biodiversity grids in the lowland tropical rainforest of Costa Rica at some point, and I would choose uh, carbon measurements any day over that that exercise. So it's, it's really tedious. And I, I have difficulties to see how countries could roll this out in um, at scale, but maybe it's not needed at scale, maybe not now, but maybe case studies would be good to know exactly what, what is happening, a country that is implementing Red Plus. When you implement the grid, what do you get in, the, in that area? Maybe compared to a neighboring country that is not having that or similar. Just a suggestion, but I know it's not, it's not the easiest work. Um, it's also important, and we heard that a lot, there's a distinction between project level Red Plus and many, many projects were, projects were implemented and we consider them more demonstration activities to learn from. And that's exactly the phase what we should be doing now. And the next step is then to nesting this, of course, into the, the bigger effort of Red Plus. But um, it's very clear from UNFCC design that the idea is to have a national level and in that way have issues that are complicated, like non-permanence of the forest uh, emission, removals or um, also leakage when you protect one forest and deforest more of, an of another area, um, at more or less addressed, at least better addressed than on, on the project level in that context. What, what we are seeing is that countries that are actively engaging in Red Plus, they have much stronger institutions already in all of the areas that are necessary. And this prepares them better than other countries, I, think, I would say in, in, many, in many cases, for the implementation of the Paris Agreement. And for both the 
uh, the implementation of their NDCs, the nationally determined contributions, but also for the measurement of, of action and for preparing the greenhouse gas inventories in the land use, land use change and forestry sector, etc. And I think, and I, I heard this also in, in one of the, um, from one of the speakers, we really need to build these institutions and we need a coordination at the national level. And I think there's, uh, from what we see, there are three reasons. One is the internal part. We can only reach a certain level, but going down to the stakeholders, to the regions, coordinating projects, coordinating um, which co-benefits are valued higher, I think that's national level. Second is external. We see an, ex an increasing, I would say, diversity of funding possibilities for Red Plus, which is, which is a very good development, but it's also complex for the country to know which standard, which measurement, how to deal with different standards and how to add everything up in the end. Because so far it doesn't, there's no standard emerging, at least for the medium and, and bigger sized forest countries that would pay for all of the emission reductions that are likely. And the third area for coordination is of course to have a measurement capacity and a planning capacity for mitigation actions. And um, we're having a, an error sign here, sorry. To have a, a planning institution and also a, a measurement institution for the actions that can track what is happening and can track this over time and can then also use the same data for reporting for Paris. What I also very much liked was the reflection that Red Plus is not, as, as is not often perceived, reducing emissions from deforestation and forest degradation at full stop. It's also enhancing forest carbon stocks through reforestation, afforestation, also restoration of degraded forests. It's also sustainable management of forests. So starting Red Plus doesn't mean the Red Plus has to make up for all of the timber that was harvested before and for the loss of that uh, added value. But it, it, it means that um, it must complement for the loss that one has from going from unsustainable harvesting to sustainable harvesting. While um, I think everybody that has worked in that field um, recognizes that there are additional benefits from sustainable use of natural resources, especially forests. Which links and also nice with the UN decade on ecosystem restoration, which puts a focus on the restoration of degraded forests is also a very, very important aspect. Um, maybe a final challenge I want to mention is the technical progress. And uh, you have mentioned that also. It's when I started to work for the Secretariat 10 years ago, um, much of what we have today, free um, to large degree, uh, open access and real-time data for much of the world forests in a high resolution was impossible to imagine. This has changed. And at the same time, almost weekly, there are new algorithms and new mechanisms on how um, GIS can analyze and um, also machine learning and algorithms can analyze different aspects of the forests and of land use and land use change. But it has to be paired with the capacity of countries to um, report on a regular basis. So it will, there, there's a balance to strike between always having the, the nicest and newest things and being able to train um, the capacity in all the countries quick enough so that this can be applied. And there's probably also a trade off in what is the, the effort of doing that. And many countries are also struggling with that. They're, they choose, they've just chosen one thing and then there are three improvements of that thing already. And uh, while they're doing that, there's a new draft or idea or project proposal for how the algorithm could be improved. So I think that's, that's something where countries also need some um, support also in analyzing where is the optimum for um, the efforts. I think in sum, I can only invite to continue this so that we have a similar event at 2030, hopefully showing that we have reduced deforestation significantly and we have gained a lot of co-benefits cool in the meantime as well. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dirk, uh, for this very insightful talk and for sharing your vast experience with us. And I, I also would hope that we meet again in 2030 and, and uh, can report on, on a successful implementation of REP+. Um, with that, we're coming to a close. Ladies and gentlemen, we have already um, went over time a bit. I think that, that, that um, this is worse to have these um, discussions here. Um, if I sum up, I, I can say that uh, the statements and the discussion in our sessions 
to the session today confirm both the importance of forestry in combating climate change as well that REP plus while it it always was and is promising has not delivered an easy solution it it is um, an convenient umbrella for many forest and land use related activities um, but the complexities uh, involved in the nexus between this forest land and uh, land use and the and all uh, climate related activities are profound and um, all these approaches may require modifications and 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 um, further development i assume um i would also again state that i think all further decision making re related to red plus should take into account the scientific evidence that we have so far and i sincerely hope that our publication will support a more coherent policy dialogue the dialogue at the one hand about the role of forests in combating climate change and also um, contribute essentially to further shaping and implementing red plus activities uh, successfully um, finally i would like to stress that our report forests climate biodiversity and people assessing the decade of red plus and as well as the associated policy brief are now available for download at the iufra website um, the link uh, will be posted in the chat right now or is already posted and um, you can order also hard copies from our from IU for headquarters and the Spanish translation of the policy brief will be available soon too. I wish to express my sincere thanks to all the speakers in this event, to all the authors of the report and the editors of the publication. And um, a sincere thanks also to our donors with whom none of the work presented today would have been possible. I would like also to thank each and every one of you for joining our event today. Um, we hope to see you again. We hope that you would will uh, download our report or order a hard copy. This recorded session will, uh, will be available on IUFRU's YouTube channel soon from tomorrow on and will be shown tomorrow at the Swedish booth for the IUFRU World Congress 2024 at 11 hours Korean time. With that, I wish you a good day, a good evening and a good night wherever you are and say thank you again. Bye-bye.